Hi everyone and good evening and welcome to an evening with Fran and Rich who are, we're very excited to have them for, for this our latest webinar about all things living aboard. Um, so uh, Fran and Rich from Floating Our Boat, sorry. So um, yeah, welcome. Thank you all for joining. So without really any further ado, we're really excited to um, invite Fran and Rich to come and talk to you all and um, hear about all their adventures and, and s s some of the things about living, all the things about living aboard. So over to you, Fran and Rich. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome aboard, Laura Maisie. Hello, Paul. Thanks, Paul, for that intro. Um, this is new for us, isn't it? <laughs> We're live like this. Anyway, um, I think first of all, what we'd really like to talk about is motivation and our motivation about doing this lifestyle. Yeah, so we're going to go back and tell you a little bit of what made us start this journey <laughs> into getting a boat and the key points that we've made um, during our five years on board that's influenced what we're doing now. And, and of course, it's a very different lifestyle now to when we first began, isn't it? Absolutely, and so yeah. um, just to talk you through that, really, and give you a little bit of an idea of the personal things that's affected us, as well as the material things in regard to the boat. We've been together now for eight years, friends, something like that. We've been married that. nearly four years, I know that. And um, the impetus was we got together late in life and uh, we didn't want to work anymore for anybody else. Uh, we wanted to spend more time with each other. We were really busy with our jobs at the time, weren't we? We were gardening and other jobs that we were doing to bolster that income, to to uh, help pay for living. And um, so anyway, I was watching YouTube and I had been watching all the channels like everybody else does. And one day I popped the question to Fran, how do you fancy living on an Arabo? <laughs> We'd got, we, we believe that you're influenced from quite an early age, that you have to follow a set program through life. You're expected to go to work, work all your working years, have money going into your pension pot, have planned out what you're going to do in your retirement. But because we'd got together so late, there was so much that we wanted to do. And we really didn't want to waste that time working. Um, so yeah, Rich popped this question to me about your fancy living on a narrowboat. And I actually spent a night pacing the floor and doing sums and working out if there was a way that we could do it and, and thought, yeah, we, we had no idea of how long we could afford to do it for, if it was going to be forever. I just said, let's have a go. Let's do it. Because we've got all the time to do the things that we wanted to do then in life. We're quite an impulsive couple anyway. We don't spend that long deliberating over issues and our life in the future. We don't try not to think of the future. We're trying to live in the now. Mm. Um, but we'd both been through difficult times when we'd met. And uh, I'd lost my wife, as lots of you all know. Fran went through a divorce. And so the, it was ideal for us just to completely start a whole new life. And uh, boy, did we <laughs> jump in at the deep end. Because we gave up what to many and to what us to us at the time seemed like an ideal life. We'd bought a house um, with a big garden and we were trying to live the good life. We were growing all of our own vegetables, selling food and plants and flowers at country markets. Um, but it still seemed very much like work, didn't it? Mm. So we just sold everything that we thought until then was our dream. We sold it. And um, and within two months, we were on our first boat, weren't we? <laughs> we were less than that, actually, on our first little boat, Constanza, uh, which was a beautiful little boat, 50 footer. And uh, there she is. Um, but we absolutely adored it, didn't we? Yeah. She, she was rough and ready. She was basic. There wasn't a fridge on board. There wasn't the shower was really tiny. If we wanted hot water, you had to run the engine. Um, and it's so true what everybody says that when you go looking for a boat, you have a list of what you wanted. And even then, we wanted a dinette. We wanted a tug deck, I think. Yeah, Is we that did. right? Yeah. Um, certain we wanted a reverse layout, we wanted all these certain things, and we just walked on Constanza who was then called rum smuggler <laughs> and um that was yeah. it that was it two days later we'll be living on her weren't we we were yeah <laughs> and two days later we quickly realized how much work needed doing on yeah. Constanza and the idea was that we would do it all ourselves but uh 
we were more interested in traveling the country, weren't we, than fixing yeah. up the nets, et cetera, and uh, kitchens. So that went by the way, didn't it? I mean, initially, I think we were quite realistic and we'd given ourselves a two year practice time to, mm. to work out what we were doing. And we decided that in two years we'd either go back to land if it wasn't working, but we would try and stay on that long or we would just reassess after two years, which is exactly what we did. But we traveled all over the country and had so many great experiences didn't we we did look over I and mean, look at this now this is currently this is the lovely map from joe from ch uh, youtube channel minimalist all that is in red is everywhere we've been and there was no way we would have visited all these beautiful places unless we'd have done what we've done taken the jump taken that leap of faith um and just gone in at the deep end really didn't we yeah I mean we've had so many experiences and I think that first year we traveled so fast we didn't really lose ourselves into the slow life it was more about travel than anything else it was more about seeing places um, and visiting places and it was lovely but after two years we sort of had a rethink then didn't we yeah we did we thought well are we going to go back to land? Have we done enough of this life? Can we afford to go back to land? Uh, but in the end, we decided, yeah, we love this life. We love the canal life. We love traveling. We love the people. So we decided, well, we're going to buy a new boat. Well, we didn't actually decide it, did we? We, no, we reversed into Elton Moss boat builders for a pump out on the last boat. And... Uh, Bought a boat, didn't on, we? On, on the spur yeah. of the moment. But we'd had a little bit of a difficult decision because we'd actually, in that first year or first two years, we'd had a holiday cottage that we'd been letting out. And the plan always was that the holiday cottage would finance our travels. Um, but we were really lucky in a way because we decided to sell that cottage. We'd run out of money and we had to make the decision. It was sell the cottage or sell the boat. And we just couldn't bring ourselves to go back to land, could mm. we, at that point? So we had to sell the cottage. Then lockdown hit, and it was really good timing because we wouldn't have been able to afford to keep the cottage during lockdown no, anyway. There no would have way. been no holiday lets. No. Um, and, of course, you know, that's when this boat came into being, didn't it? And it took, yeah. you know, about nine months, I think, to have this one built. Um, so it was nearly three years after we'd first started that we were on Constanza. And we absolutely adore this boat. It's so comfortable, isn't it? Everything is easy. You know, yeah. heating and hot water is at the touch of a switch. We've got bow thrusters on the boat to guide the front of the boat. It's really comfortable. We've got the Danette that we're sitting on, which is the one thing we really wanted, wasn't it? Yeah, so, yeah. Because we do a lot of work yeah. on, the, on the laptop and we like to play card games and uh, other games at the table. And we yeah. do, don't we? It's fabulous. But life changed, I think, when we moved onto this boat. Everything changed. Uh, Constanza was really hard work. We had um, no heating except for the wood-burning stove. Mm -hmm. So you always had to make sure you had coal or wood. And often we'd, we were getting low on supplies of fuel and we'd have to go out foraging wood if the coal man wasn't coming. That was it. To keep warm, we had to do that. We had no hot water unless the engine was running. So we had to move every few days to get hot water. And it was constantly hard work. And it, I quite enjoyed that in a way, you know. Oh, you love to wear a hair shirt, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's what comes to being a Londoner, I think, you know, real living. But no, we did. It, it was hard work. And then suddenly we could relax a little bit because we know now that if we run out of solid fuel, we can put central heating mm. on. And it is a different definitely a different life isn't it we are more relaxed on this boat that's for sure we uh we have slowed right down since we've been on laura Maisie. we don't do the miles we used to do um we don't put up as many videos as we used to do we just absolutely slowed down and just take life day by day and uh, it, we're enjoying it even more but i think it helped us realize that the whole reason for doing boating i don't think was just for traveling it wasn't for me although that's what we did in the first few years it was about enjoying our passions in life as well which were then we thought it was artwork for you and my weaving had developed that i was able to sell stuff which i was amazed about um and so now because we haven't got to spend so much time 
we didn't even have a fridge, did we, on, no. on Constanza? You know, I don't know how we survived, but we did. Getting used to drinking Just, warm beer. You know, we can actually have meals out of the freezer occasionally now, but we've got more time to be creative, do our artwork, and we've realised that it is more just about being that is what we wanted. It mm. wasn't necessarily mm. just about travelling, although we still love the travelling and we've still got lots of places to see, haven't we? We're fortunate that we, we, we are fortunate. We haven't forgotten that, that the life we live, we are privileged. And people say, oh, you've retired so early. But to be honest, we haven't retired. We still spend time making videos. It takes a lot of time out of our lives. Fran does her weaving, which we sell online. I do paintings, which we sell online, but we're fortunate in the fact that we are doing, working at the things we like to work at. That's the difference, yeah. we're not working for somebody else, you know, yeah. and yeah. we are fortunate and I don't think we'll ever forget that. Uh, but in order to do that, we've got to live simply. And mm. that's the answer. You know, we, we do live very, very cheaply. I think cheaper than anybody else that I know. Our outgoings are quite small, uh, the way we eat, the way we clothe ourselves. Um, because we're trying to live within that income that we're creating, aren't we? Um, and it is cheaper living on an Arab boat than living on land. Um, we did a cost evaluation, didn't we? I think it was 18 months or so ago. And it worked out that once you've bought the boat and without clothing, and without food, it was costing us somewhere in the region of £10 a day yeah. to live, to have this boat yeah. on the water and to travel. And that included fuel, etc. So it is a cheap way of living. But it has its problems. It isn't easy sometimes, is it? No, it isn't easy. And and the one thing that I would say to anybody that's thinking of doing this is if you if you've got problems in a relationship and you think this might be the answer to go off and start a new life and try some adventure, let's get an Arabo and go traveling. Just don't Please do don't. it. <laughs> because you really have got to have a strong relationship to live in a tiny place, a tiny space like this. Um, and sometimes we get questions that, um, you know, a man might send in and say he wants to do it and his wife doesn't want to do it. What should he do or vice versa? And I really don't, do don't know what to say because I just don't know what to say. No. You know, you've, you've both got, got to go into it, it yeah. really with a yeah. willing heart and have a go. Um, I never knew that this life was going to suit me so well until we tried it. It actually um, suits you more than me most of the time, doesn't it? I'm the one that gets absolutely. a bit fed up occasionally, especially yeah. in the winter when it's dark at four o'clock, you know, and you're closing the curtains and you're in a steel tube. So uh, it, it has its problems. It can have uh, its issues. You've got to really get on with the partner you're living with. And, but if you live on your own, that's fine, obviously. You've got to get on with yourself. But um yeah, so in a nutshell, that's it. But what are we doing now? What's, well, what does the future hold for us? Come this spring and the end of last winter, we, st we still felt unsettled. Mm. You know, you'd think we've now got everything we want. We've got this beautiful boat that can last us as long as we live, hopefully. Um, but we've both got green fingers and we were both itching to grow something, weren't we? We were itching to get our hands in the ground again, yeah. But it's, I, I don't think it's just about growing. It's, it's a whole lifestyle thing it's we've got tired of um not being able to eat and live as we want and we can't afford to buy a nice big patch of land and build a little house in it and live in the middle of nowhere it's just not on the cards for us so we had to work out a way of doing that simple simple living as we can mm. and that's what prompted us to think to find a little bit of land isn't it to grow on yes yeah, so we've got this lovely mooring in the deepest depths of Yorkshire we've it's just a handkerchief little plot uh that we've there it is on on the screen that we've managed to cultivate if you like and uh and we're already eating from it in two months yeah. we're, we're eating every day yeah. from our plot whether it's just salad leaves or turnips are the thing at the moment <laughs> yes <laughs> Baldrick. yes we're having turnip salads and turnip all sorts but um it's it's the eating fresh food, eating well, having somewhere just to sit. And we're working outdoors as well now. I've been weaving outdoors. You're yet to paint outdoors, but you will be, won't you? Yeah. Um, because we still, and I admit, we did think again about going back to land. We mm. even thought about buying a flat and going back to land and getting an allotment to grow on. But we just, there's something so about the, the borders, the boundaries mm. of living on land with neighbours and brick walls I just don't think I would. we're not there yet not we're us. not there and um, we still want to travel so 
That's so, where we are, really. And what's next? We don't know. We don't know how long we'll be here, do we? We don't know how long no. we'll be on a mooring, but uh, we don't care. We're we just don't living in the to, now. We don't tend to think about that. We know that we're OK now and we know that there are options in the future, you know. So that's it. That's where we that's are. That's us in a pot potted history. <laughs> I mean, that's awesome. I mean, it's so nice to sort of, to, to, it's one of those things you always wonder about is living in quite a confined space um, can put, as you say, can put quite a pressure on someone's relationship, but um, yeah. you seem to, you seem to have grown stronger that do it, which is great. Um, we're going to start back at the beginning, I think. Um, <laughs> we're going we're to go back. How did you choose what possessions you took from your house with you? Because obviously we, we Came, you came from sort of houses. How did you choose what you took with you, what didn't come, what didn't come with you, and all that sort of thing? We weren't worried about furniture and uh, material things like that, were we? Television. We don't have a television on the boat. We, when we want to watch stuff, we watch it on the laptop. So we got rid of everything, didn't we? We More because we'd we'd not been together that long. We'd actually furnished our house at the time. Even then, a lot of that stuff came from second-hand shops and mm. charity shops, and it was stuff that we'd accumulated together. So there weren't many things that had years of memories behind them. It was all quite new stuff. So we have got a lock-up, um, and we've got... It's tiny. How big is our lock-up? Uh, five foot by eight foot. It's got uh, a few of Rich's bikes in it. I think quite yeah. a few of your bikes in there that you can pull up with. all the personal <laughs> treasures, photographs and jewellery, you know, not that we've got expensive jewellery, but everything that means something to us, and most of it is books as well, yeah. is in that lockup. So, you know, you have to really think, do I treasure what we've got in the house or do I really want this lifestyle? So. I, I, for me, it wasn't a struggle, actually. No, no. And I remember we'd only just decided to buy the boat and it was Christmas. And when we took the Christmas tree down, I got a shoebox that big. And we decided that all the Christmas decorations had to fit in that shoebox. That's all we can fit. And that's, that's still going now, isn't it? The shoebox Christmas. Um, so, yeah, it was yeah. fine. It wasn't. We're not materialistic people, so it was quite easy for us. Next and question, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. As a, as a first time boat buyer, do you think it's a good idea to buy through a broker? Did you buy your first boat through a broker? Or no, actually, we we bought our boat from um, a YouTuber who had, who's a, had a channel going for a few months or so, and uh, because we, we kind of knew him and we'd been watching the boat on the channel, we were we were quite confident, weren't we, that that everything would be all right. In retrospect, um, I'd probably go through a broker you know uh next time well next time i mean it, it, next time. next time <laughs> i would probably go through a broker because you've got that little bit of confidence there that uh you know it's been surveyed etc we didn't even have a survey did we we just put, took no. it on you know and no. then... you don't don't hear many bad stories about people buying them privately but we were just lucky that we knew this person didn't we mm. um and i would so, al yeah. also again i would also buy second hand first time round. Because you don't yeah. know what you want unless you've been and lived on a boat. You really don't know how you want things arranging on the boat. So that's I would always buy second hand first. Yeah, definitely. And had we spent a few more grand on the first boat, we probably wouldn't have this boat, would we? Well, that's always true. You know, we might have we might have just bought a spent more on a boat, bought a better boat. I don't want to knock Constanza. Don't listen, Constanza. But bought a you know a more comfortable boat, and we could have still been on it now. But um, you can't regret anything or do anything differently, no. but definitely I would never say buy a new boat first because you just you just don't know, do you? Yeah, so it's all good, good, sensible advice. No, very good advice. Um, and you've obviously got Jess and Archie on board with you. So how do you cope with muddy towpaths and dogs keep keeping a boat clean inside and all that sort of thing? How do you manage that, Fran? <laughs> yeah, you have to, <laughs> yeah, you actually have to be quite relaxed and take a step back from it. You know, if you want a show home and you want everything pristine, don't have dogs on a boat. Uh, we chose wooden floor on this because we know that any mud the dogs bring in will dry within half an hour. We can vacuum, sweep, mop, and it's gone. Archie the Spaniel's the muckiest one, isn't he? He'll, he'll yeah. get absolutely filthy. So yeah. when he, excuse me, when he's really bad, we'll just get a soapy bucket out the back and wash him down and then dry him off as best we can and 
Let him on. Fortunately, he does like a swim, so we can yeah. always send him off. <laughs> Even midwinter, we can send him off for a swim. We've got a pile of old towels at the back of the boat, so they just get a really good rub down. And in the winter, it's fine. They'll just snuggle in front of the fire and dry off. Well, I say that Archie doesn't actually, because Archie is he, he likes to run around the when boat. Yeah, when wet he's wet, he flounces around, doesn't he? But I, I just think it's a case of being quite relaxed about it. And if you're going to get stressed about a little bit of mud on your boat, you're in for a bad time because <laughs> it is going to get muddy. Just relax. That's the inverter fan in the background going off. <laughs> <laughs> and and we're getting into some of the really practical sort of stuff now. Um, how do you deal with post when you're continuously cruising? Post? Post, post. what's post? We have everything you possibly can. You have via email, all your bank statements, etc. come to us by email. There are certain things you cannot avoid, like driving licenses. You've got to have a driving license with an address. So we use um, our daughter's house. She use, we use her uh, as a correspondence address, don't we? Yeah, yeah. And anything important gets sent to her, and uh, then next time we see her, we'll pick it up parcels you can nowadays get things delivered via delivery agencies um dpd mm. and pickup points so we do get stuff sent if we want to buy anything we can get them sent by a pickup point and you can also get things delivered to post offices addressed um post restaurant if you have an agreement with your local post office but it doesn't always work out it's a bit no, hit all and of miss. them do it do they no it is a hit and miss i mean fortunately nowadays most things can be paper free mm. um it's just the odd thing and you know some obscure things like our boat license we have to have an address to get a boat license even though we're telling them we're living on the boat yeah. <laughs> which always <laughs> seems a bit bizarre to me but it can be tricky, but there's ways around it. You you just need that one official address, really, for your bank and yeah, and yeah. driving licenses and things. So. Well, yeah, it's 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 always a tricky one, isn't it? Because it's one of the things you're always between places or or in a with with a continuous cruising thing. I know you've got the plot of land now. It's kind of but you move on so much and yeah, yeah. you always have to all the stuff. You always have to look ahead to where you're going to be. Yeah. And then if you order something from Amazon, you order it to, to be delivered at the next town, for instance, you know. So. And unfortunately, the world hasn't moved on and it still thinks that the rules are that you have to have an address. And even a, it was one optician that I went to. I don't know if it's Boots, Specsavers, whoever. They just couldn't believe that I didn't have an address and argued with me to say you must have an address everybody's got an address and I said no I haven't I stuck to my ground and said I don't have an address and they just couldn't believe it and couldn't cope the computer was going crazy we don't have an address here for instance now a lot of moorings will have an address but we don't so um we're still in a continuous cruising sort of mode yeah yeah I suppose it can be quite and and, and following on uh, following on from that John and Sue who met you at Crick I've asked, how, how do you manage regular access to medical care and all that sort of thing? This is the biggest question I think we always get asked. Um, in five years, I've only had to once, fortunately, touch wood, go and see a doctor. And that was two months ago in um, near Keithley. And uh, we put it off and we put it off. Well, I did. Fran was always telling me to go and see the doctor. And we put it off and put it off. And um, it was so easy. We just walked in, told them our situation. We registered as a temporary um, uh, patient. patient. And uh, a couple of days later, they phoned up and says, right, book an appointment. So we booked an appointment, saw the doctor, got seen, no problem. Everything was fine. I had to go to the hospital to have a check. Everything was OK. No problem. You are, Everybody is entitled to have a GP, be registered in a GP. And if you go to a local GP and they refuse to register you, they're wrong and you you do you might sometimes have to argue but you just have to stand your ground um but as you say for emergency stuff you just go in and say you're visiting the area and, and you can be seen you know very quickly you've been twice to a gp haven't you in the last five years yeah. fortunately not soon but not recently but both times you've had no problem uh, registering absolutely temporarily none. Yeah. absolutely none so it, you know it really isn't a problem. It's just another one of those things. We, we we tend to think we've got to have a doctor that we've had for years and that we know 
but things change things have changed and also of course now a lot of things are done online so even if you manage to stay registered with your GP that you're already with now which you can do prescriptions can be sent to anywhere in the country and consultations can be done online even mm -hmm. routine checkups like diabetic checks can all be done online so mm -hmm. it isn't such a problem anymore no I you kind of you kind of preempted the next question was about repeat prescriptions but you just said that's all online and easily yeah, yeah. yeah you just but, tell them where you're going to be and they can send them through i think yeah i think boots do it countrywide don't they you mm. can have your prescription sent to boots but um fortunately we don't have to so i'm not sure we haven't tried it out to be honest and uh, andy and sally have asked anything you'd recommend for a boat to accommodate grandchildren for when they stay at weekends at a time don't have them <laughs> simple <laughs> A small cage, maybe? No, no. A cage. <laughs> <laughs> Drag on the back. Uh, I guess we've got a small granddaughter who's three that has been to the boat, but only visited for days and hasn't stayed on here. So I guess for security, you'd have to have stair gates on the doors to stop them climbing out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and windows. You see plenty of boats. Uh, with small children on don't you and there's other youtubers out there now that have had or are having babies so they're probably the ones to ask yeah um when you think back over the years you know boating families lived on tiny boats with all their children um so yeah i know i would say teach your children to swim utmost and go, go for it i mean it's quite fun for a little kid to be on a narrow boat oh, yeah. down the country that would be great yeah. It? yeah yeah so just embrace it yeah and be prepared yeah because it, it's uh, one of the, it's got to be important because obviously the safety is all, all is all important and there's and, and there's water all around you so yes learning to swim just but keeping an eye out for them really i suppose is uh is, is hugely yeah. important it's you know you can't always let your fears stop this is the thing isn't it people let fears stop children having fun and enjoying life and what a fantastic experience for a little one to go off mm -hmm. be on a boat and go cruising you know just life jackets and precautions but yeah and um, i mean just from that the um i know you've done both but and i and i know where you are it's kind of a permanent more but do you recommend having a permanent mooring or just being the freedom that you've always had this is from Malcolm Hasler by the way um or just permanently roam do you think do you think it's better to have a permanent base and just go out and do the things or do you think it's better to have just continuously, continuously it's really roam? really down to the individual isn't it if you fancy a base where you can come back to all the time we're quite enjoying it now I'm going out for trips and then just popping back to our little base where mm. our garden is that's fine but I think I think continuously cruising is the best way yeah. it, ha it has to be and not knowing where you're going to end up. You know, we get to a junction. We've done it before. We've tossed a coin. We've got to a junction and tossed the coin to see which way we're going to go, haven't we? Um, yeah. But it's only the garden. I think that that's the reason that we're staying here in one place. And already um, we're planning further cruises, aren't we? Mm. Once in, and we're just enjoying going away for a weekend. If, if we could take the garden with us, then I would continually cruise. And people have suggested that we have a boat. Tow a boat. Tow a boat with, with a garden. garden. And some chickens. You know, and I will talk about that now because but you, I have seen that done, but you can't water a garden. You can't water vegetables when you're travelling on a boat. You can't use canal water to grow vegetables. Unless you filter it, of course. Yeah, yeah so it's just too difficult. But it's as you said, it's a personal thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We can't possibly answer that we've only done this we've only been here for two months in a year's time we might be climbing the walls to get away and go traveling again we jumped at the chance of this little mooring here because they're like hen's teeth aren't they mm. um little moorings like this up and down the canal they're really you know sought after so we just this opportunity came along so we jumped at it and at the moment we're enjoying it two years time who knows we don't know <laughs> the two-year itch will come in and we'll be somewhere yeah. else <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll head down south and onto on, onto the thames or something and do, do well, you know you say that but we have actually said that you know we might stay up here for two years and when we've walked all the hills and walked all the the canals and done what we want to do we might look for a mooring somewhere else and set up yeah, again closer to family down you know, south yeah who knows but yeah at the moment it's lovely love the thames going up north North Thames, isn't it? it up to um, Lechlane. Lechlane. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, you've kind of you've kind of answered Sean Cameron's question about getting a butty and putting an allotment on the back of it. So yeah, we've covered we've covered oh, that one off. It, but it has been done. Is that our Sean friend Sean? Yeah. Camera. Yeah, it has been done, but nobody's videoing it. So I yeah, would say you if go. you want to have a go, <laughs> then get get going on it. I'd be interested to watch. <laughs> <laughs> it would be quite interesting to, you know, whether when you get all the beanstalk boom poles up and all that sort of stuff, you sort of start growing it all. It could be quite an interesting uh, concept, really. Absolutely. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, a nice little sort of follow on from that. If, if you had, I mean, let's uh, you continuously cruise. It's all the same. But if you had to be trapped on one section of canal, this is Paul Smith stories asked this. What 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 area would you choose? Ooh. Hello, Paul. Oh, that's that is really difficult. We fell in love with the Peak Forest Canal in Derbyshire, didn't we? That yeah. was wonderful. Yeah. But um <clears throat> anywhere, to be honest, this canal is gorgeous. These the the, the countryside around here is fantastic. And uh, we haven't explored it enough quite yet, have we? We've got to get out of the a bit more. This has got to take some beating, to be honest. This Leeds and it's Liverpool like, Canal, where we are now, yeah. takes some beating, yeah. The only, the only problem is that I know that this canal has problems with low low water in the summer. We've got swing that bridges. And so many swing uh, bridges. They're hard work, aren't they? Or, <laughs> you know, as we get older and we're not so agile, maybe the Ashby Canal. Ashby Canal's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. You haven't got the locks no on locks there. there yeah. <laughs> this well, is just thinking ahead. <laughs> although Simon ha Simon Hamilton's just um, just messaged in to say, um, when are you going to visit them on the Lancaster Canal? Ah, oh, yes. Well, that was the plan for this summer. Well, we were going to go down this autumn, one of the last crossings across the Ribble Link. Um, but now we've got this, uh, and the, the, most of the bookings were booked up, I think, as well. I think we can't gonna, leave this, can we? We were going to do it for summer, weren't we, originally? I think we were going to go across yeah. the summer, but, but of course, we can't be away for summer now because that's when we're growing. And the other option is that it's when is it open? It's only from I think it's just September, um, April, March, September. April to September, I think. Yeah. So the other option is that we could go over in September. Um, but that would mean leaving the boat and the garden right until April, which is a little bit it's long. A long time, but so, I think it'd be worth it, though, to be honest. Yeah, it? we would love to do it. We would love to do it. So we just have to see. And, and so this this year, um, Luke Garner has just said, have you got any plans where you're going to travel over the rest of this year? You've sort of just covered a bit of that off. Are you, are you sort of mainly staying where you are and around yeah, the area? Yeah, we're, we're taking days out. We've we just come back last week from a five day cruise wasn't it yeah. down down to almost into Burnley and back and that was lovely wasn't it looking at things we hadn't seen before and there's so much to explore everybody that watches our channel will know that we don't just stick to the canal we move out into the environs and go exploring so there's plenty of that to be done here we will go traveling come autumn but it's absolutely no point in us planning until we know what the closures are going to be winter closures um, because whatever plans we make, that's going to be closed. We know that. Mm. It always is. So as soon as the closures are announced in August, we'll sit and make some plans and maybe do two long cru cruises, maybe just one long one over the winter. Um, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. I suppose the canals are a bit quieter in winter, aren't they? It's all right. I'm telling Fran to get her hands off the table. The, the, camp, the computer's okay. doing this. <laughs> shaking the table. Sorry, Paul, what was you saying? Yeah, no, that's, I suppose that's because one, one of the questions sort of came to my mind when you talk about it, the continuous cruising. It, it, is it difficult to find places to stay overnight or is it relatively easy? Have you ever had problems or anything like that? Or We've never had any problems whatsoever. The, the biggest problem we had was some kids banging on the roof once, wasn't it? We've, we've, the, the canal system is so safe. Uh, I can vouch for that it is really is easier, though yeah. this weekend we cruised off um there was an open garden scheme in a nearby village um so it wasn't very far away but it took us two days to get there so we took the boat and um, then quickly realized that it was holiday season there were holiday boats out and there weren't many moorings left were there no, um, that's, tight, wasn't it? that's the problem is that there sometimes are not enough mooring spots on the canals but if you're prepared to just stick pins in and maybe gangplank to the side, which we do, then it's fine. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and Laura and Sean have asked, what's the most tricky, difficult plant or veg you have had to try to grow on the boat, either successful or unsuccessful? Uh, on the boat? I didn't have a lot of success. I was so keen, wasn't I, to grow stuff on the boat, on the roof. 
we had courgettes which never really developed no, they, they need to be in a really big pot don't they courgettes yeah. so um, french beans it's always the salad leaves are a must because even on constanza we had salad leaves all summer long to eat mm. we grew little cherry tomatoes really well on the roof I don't um, think there's anything you can't grow if you put your heart and mind to it. If you really want to, then you will. Yeah. You know, but um, we yeah. weren't we weren't that worried about growing potatoes, for instance. You know, because of <laughs> space. But but people even do that in bags in their well decks. If you want to give your boat over to it, um, I've seen boats with their roofs just covered mm. with vegetables and plants. Mm. It's just a little bit of a compromise for us. Sometimes it was restricting our, our view. I know courgette plants, she used to moan like mad about my courgette plants on Constanza because we couldn't see where we were going. They'd got so big on the roof. Um, I've seen runner beans growing up and trailing around doors yeah, on boats. Yeah. So Be as creative as you yeah. like. Yeah. And obviously, if you're not continually cruising, then it's so much easier. You can grow all over the roof. But if you've got tunnels and things like that, it's not so easy, is it? Um, no. Yeah. And... Um we've had a question coming from from all the way from america from carol uh, i love how your garden is growing on land what are you feeding the soil and plants to make them so health healthy <laughs> nothing is yet, are we? We, oh, you're, you're making your brew aren't you as yeah. usual i'm making a, a witch's brew up from comfrey and nettle leaves oh boy does it stink <laughs> <laughs> so basically you just bung them into a bucket or a container, fill it up with chopped up nettles and water and leave it for a couple of weeks. And the nettles break down to make this stinky brown liquid. And we're watering once a week with that, mm. aren't we, at the moment? We did have, we, we had to make the beds from scratch and the ground wasn't great. So there is some um, farmyard manure in the bottom, isn't there, on it? But we're, that's it. That's all the food that we're using at the moment. And so far they're doing really well but last night we were invaded weren't we yes. by the biggest slugs that you've ever seen anywhere so the next brew is going to be garlic tea that i've got to make and spray everything that the neighbors are going to love us aren't they there will be so many vacancies on this mooring spot soon <laughs> Um, because yeah, we're going to use garlic tea all over them next to keep. The yeah, not away. not on the salad leaves though. They can't put garlic tea. Ready on dressed. That. Ready dressed garlic <laughs> leaves. Yeah, with salad, garlic salad. Well, that, 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 I'm not sure how to put this, you know, Rich, because the, 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 the way you're talking there is kind of like is some Maureen and Doug have both asked, when are you going to produce your cookbook? Ah, there you go, friend. <laughs> That's a regular question as well, isn't it? You, everybody loves your uh, little cooking inc incidences. <laughs> segments on the know, video. Incident is probably better, actually. I'm amazed, really, because I never, ever considered myself a great cook. Um, the recipes that we've done on the videos have all been things that I think are appropriate for narrowboat living, i.e., they're store cupboard ingredients, you know, especially during the winter, we tend to stockpile certain things in the cupboards that, you know, if you can't get to the shops for days, you've got something there. Um, I'm, I'm not a creator. I don't think I'm a creative cook. So I'm always a bit amazed at this, really. I think you're a practical and, and a good cook and you're the food you cook is good. Yeah, I, I, I think it's I think a lot of it is about the fact that it's not just you don't go. It's not all bought from the supermarket and all that sort of stuff. You go and forage and cook up all the stuff that you Yeah. all that sort of stuff. Is, There's a lot of stuff in there. The foraging is a tricky one because um, I'm very nervous that if I put something in there and people pick the wrong thing, you're nervous. I could be <laughs> 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 I could be in a lot of trouble. So. There's not going to be a foraging cook book or a foraging book anytime soon. We have thought about writing a book of some kind. Yeah. It is. It's, it, it's mulling that over yeah. at the moment, aren't we? So whether there would be room for some recipes in there, um, you know, at the moment there is a recipe section on the website, isn't there? Which, you know, uh, <laughs> I must do more of. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe a winter project sometime. But you know. But I, there's a lot, there's there's quite a few questions around this sort of thing. I mean, the next one is from Andy and Sally, which is how do you get on with your chili penguin stove? Oh, um, yeah. They're looking at a B 
Tang, the tool to cook on our bone. Would you recommend it? Let's put it that way. I love it. Absolutely love it. You get so much yeah. use out of it. I mean, I have to say, I can cook, but I don't enjoy cooking. So I, I, it's very rarely, I'll do breakfasts and lunches, but evening meals, 99 out of 100, you'll cook, won't you? And but, you do wash up afterwards. I do wash, just up, do yeah, the yeah. wash up. Um, the stove is brilliant, especially in the winter. We cook, we make nearly all of our bread. We very rarely buy bread. In the summer, that's made in the Mr. D's thermal cooker all winter. As soon as the fire is alight, the bread is cooked in the fire. Um, and soups, casseroles all go in the oven. You can cook on an ordinary stove as well. We did on the last one. You put, you just put your pots on the top. But the oven, you know, we're making cakes in it. I'm making your rhubarb crumble in it. Um, and it's lovely and I, it just looks nice as well and it's we've never known a fire we've had quite a few wood burning stoves in our houses and various places this is so easy to light so it? easy to light and it gets hot really quickly as well doesn't yeah. it which is it's just yeah. fantastic yeah. so it's yeah we're really pleased with it and fully recommend it chili penguin have been quite good to us as well we've <laughs> lost our chimney didn't we and we've had a new one or a chimney cow got a new one sent out and you know, they've been good people to deal with as well. I yeah, think. easy people so. to deal with, and they do what they say when they say they're going to do it, don't yeah. they? So, yeah, yeah. All, all thumbs up with that one. Um, I, I, a good comment from Sean coming in about, I think your comments about the snails. At least you can throw slugs and snails into the canal. <laughs> oh, that's just downright <laughs> cruel, Sean. <Yeah. laughs> um, Fran's leaning towards Buddhism, so that's a no-no. They, at the moment, <laughs> they're getting launched into the cow field next yeah. to us, but um, I know they are supposed to come home. They've got a home uh, instinct, haven't they? You yeah. know, I figure it might take them a little while, but... <laughs> I'm looking out the window for them as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've decided now we're going to do three, three evening checks, like seven, eight at nine o'clock or eight, nine, ten o'clock, go out there. And that we must eventually, they must get fed up with being flung over into the power field, <laughs> mustn't they? <so. laughs> It'd be, it'd be the first one the first ones you throw are probably coming back now and the rest of them are still, yeah. still wondering what's going on um okay uh, is there a best season for a new narrowboater to join the lifestyle such as spring summer winter, Com winter. Uh, a question from sean oh uh, sean winter yeah if you can survive a winter you, you're doing okay yeah. we did we started just at the well in february wasn't it yeah and uh when we picked our first boat up we were actually frozen in so we couldn't move for a couple of days no. could we so yeah and shortly after that we had to have the stove replaced or reset didn't we because it wasn't safe it had not been bolted down we had to have a new chimney put onto it um and it was freezing and we had no stove for two days mm. and somebody working we actually had to sleep under double duvets and get dressed in the middle of the night because we were so cold so once you get through that it's easy running isn't it I think if you was to start on in the summer when it's all so lovely and easy winter might suddenly hit you a bit hard but that would be that certainly I would think autumn maybe autumn, end of yeah. autumn let yourself in a little bit gently but do a winter yeah don't let people put you off of winter cruising it's, it's our favorite time isn't yeah. it absolutely favorite time of the year yeah. winter cruising you can see through the trees the views the canals are really quiet and uh, we just love it. And it's, it's so cosy. Nobody yet mm. has dared to ask, is it cold on a boat? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just so, so cosy in the winter. Yeah. That's what a log burn is for, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. It is. yeah. yeah. And I know we have actually considered getting a diesel stove as well. Rich has had a bit of an asthma allergy problem over the last couple of years. And we, there's no getting away from it, but solid fuel stoves can be messy. They are and dusty, you, aren't they? Yeah. You do have a layer of dust over everything in the wind, so you have to keep on top of it. But I, I just love the wood burning and the mm. coal burning stove. Just love it. Yeah. There's something very romantic about it, isn't it, in a way? And we are um, romantic. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you said that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and can, uh, can you recommend a minimum comfortable size of narrow boat for a couple from Malcolm? We Our first boat was 50 foot, as we said, and that was fine because 90% uh, of the time you're in this space here in the in the saloon, aren't you? Yeah. Or the kitchen, dinette and saloon. So it doesn't matter what length your boat is, more or less, this is the same in, in most boats, isn't it? Yeah. Same length. 
So yeah, 50 foot, 45 foot minimum, I suppose, would be fine for living on board. Otherwise, if you're recreational using it, then any size, fine. We've yeah. met a couple a couple of times on the canals and they've, um, I think it's only 40 foot their boat, but they have to make their bed up. They're, they're 35, sober, 35, 35 foot, that's beautiful. And they're very happy, it's beautiful, but they just have to actually put the slats across the bed each night, um, take the sofa apart, put slats in and turn it into a bed every night. But they're quite happy with that. And of course, it's so much easier to move around and so much easier to keep warm. But I guess you've really got to be quite minimalistic and quite organised to do that. Mm. Um, and maybe not with two dogs. Yeah, no, maybe not. 50 foot, we were fine on 50 foot. Yeah. You know, we enjoy 58, um, but 50 foot was fine. Yeah. And I think that goes back to what you were saying earlier about you learn from your first boat purchase, don't you? So your second one, which you might go second hand with your first boat because you learn from that to, to make sure you get, not necessarily get it right for the second one, but you know what I mean, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Your, your experience tells you what you need. It does, it does indeed. I mean, the, on the last boat, the one thing we always wanted and we looked at having it retrofitted so many times was a Danette like this somewhere to sit and be and, and congregate in the evening together and just so you're opposite to each other looking and talking it is it, it, having a donette is the thing i think don't you it is boat. yeah and but in fact the donette very very easily and quickly converts to a bed don't tell the family yeah we haven't told them that yet because we don't <laughs> want them staying too often but we no, have there's... actually considered letting you have the bedroom as an art studio and using this as our mm. bed you know and just living in this space and then having that as a studio on the back but and of course because um, it converts into a bed sorry folks because it converts into a bed we have said in, in the depths of winter when it's really cold that we'd sleep in here because the fire's in here but we never did did we, we did it once I think we did, we did it, it once, once. yeah and, yeah yeah but we do like a cold bedroom anyway don't we, we so yeah yeah Oh yeah, well we, we know someone who slept on that slept on that Danette, I think from the Coast to Canal video, don't we? <laughs> we do. She Good did, yeah. <laughs> um Kate's asked a question. What are your top storage tips? The top storage tip is don't have so much rubbish that you have to store. Just bring along with you the bare essentials. Because believe me, you soon quickly fill up your spaces along the along the uh way don't you yeah, we've been yeah, on here yeah. for two years now and these these storage units under the seats are chock-a-block chock a block with stuff so much more stuff on this boat than we had on constanza um because we've got the space we've just filled it but everything should have two purposes as well two uses don't ever have anything that's single use for one thing everything is no. going to be useful for two things at least um and clothes is the interesting one isn't it because they are we redesigned our bedroom on this um, and ended up with less wardrobe space than Elton Moss would normally put on a boat because we wanted bookshelves. That was important to us. But clothes, we haven't got that many. But then I buy from charity shops. So when I'm bored, get rid of them and buy something new and everything gets rolled up. Um, One thing we quite like is the under the gunnel here, this storage space, this, this is about that wide. And it goes from sort of waist height down to the ground, down to the floor. That's an ideal space that, the, you know, that we could put doors on that, sliding doors and have shelves in there that would fit lit books and More tins stuff. In, the, in the kitchen area. That would be great for putting tins of food, yeah. wouldn't it? It'd brilliant, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, our boat isn't particularly gimmicky when it comes to storage. Some boats builders put in sliding cupboards, that are sliding racks that come out of cupboards. We actually haven't got anything like that on here. Uh, one of those carousel carousel things, is that yeah. what in the kitchen, in the, yeah. in the galley cupboards. They're brilliant because we haven't got that in here and we wish we had. Uh, friends of ours have and, and it looks, it, it, it works really well, doesn't it? But you just get, again, you just get used to it. And you do have to have a little bit of discipline, I think, don't you, with stuff. That's the rule as well. Just yeah. just take the bare essentials with you because you'll mm -hmm. soon fill up the cupboards. And you don't miss what you haven't got, to be honest. I think, you know, get, this goes back right to your earlier question about what did you decide to bring with you. We very rarely, I don't think ever, say, why didn't we bring that? Why didn't we have that with us? Because you don't think about things. Mm. You just, you know, you work with what you've got. It's an interesting one that when you when when you sort of mention books and things like that, because do you are you want are you the 
one of the people that sort of likes to keep their books or are you happy to sort of because there's lots of places uh, around where you can just go and swap them around with uh, you know get the old red po post boxes with book swap things in them and things like that do you take advantage of those we we do well there's a lot of villages have telephone boxes don't they mm -hmm. filled with books nowadays <clears throat> lots of people say to us <clears throat> excuse me have a um a kindle we've got both got kindles for reading because that saves a lot of space but we can't bear it i can't bear reading from a kindle from a screen we much prefer having a physical copy in your hands um but we we tend to keep the books we like yeah. if we've read a book and we really have enjoyed it we keep it yeah. um not that we read it ever again particularly but uh, it's nice to pass on to people especially if it's a hardback book yeah. but i think we have got better at sharing you know there's other boaters around that we know have got similar tastes um and so i've sent quite a few books off to chris and shell um because the, but the trouble is that they send me books back again so i haven't made any space i've just got more things to find <laughs> But that is a bit of a downfall for us, isn't it? Books. We've got, yeah. yeah, we have got a lot of bookshelves on this boat in the bedroom and also here in the um, in the lounge area. Um, but that's our thing. Yeah. We actually do think sometimes Rich is quite, not, I wouldn't say obsessed, but he's quite convinced that the boat is tilting a little bit yes, this way. Absolutely. And all the books are on this side of the boat. And we do think we've over it a little bit. We might have to get underneath and take some of the ballast out of this side and put on that side because this is where the bookshelves are. But that's what it'll have to be. Books are ballast. <laughs> that, that's a that's a very good ballast to have, isn't it? It is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sally and Anne Carter have asked, having previously had a boat without a bow thruster and now having one on your current boat, which do you prefer? The last boat didn't need a bow thruster. It was only 50 feet long, so there's no way you need a bow thruster on a 50-foot boat. I think so, anyway. But uh, having had one, and we, we, asked, we asked not to have one on this boat, but it was already fitted um, in, when the shell was built. It's a boon. It really is. It does make such a difference yeah. to uh, turn in the boat, going into locks occasionally, you'll misjudge it and just give the bow thruster a blast and it writes you. Um, but most whenever we want to turn this boat it's always windy for some reason <laughs> or other and it does help it, it just spins the, the boat around quicker for you gets you out of trouble i think i'm glad that we didn't have them on the first boat because we know how to drive without them mm. now but we don't um, and in fact when we first got them i was a nightmare because i couldn't work out which button was for which bow thruster and out of principle to, as well know, you refused to use them did. didn't you at the first for the first few months yeah, I'm a just bit... gonna switch the bow thrusters on <laughs> i was a bit bloody minded about it but um i'm bow thruster queen now <laughs> yeah. they, they call it the scream of shame when you hear somebody's bow thrusters going there's just times you know if you're going into a lock and you've got another boat coming in with you you can just literally move sideways across with the bow thrusters um, and it would take you ages to do that if you were just trying to steer the boat in, wouldn't it? Just, and reversing yeah. is so much easier with a bow thruster. It takes all the effort out of reversing, doesn't it? Yes. Just to use the front as a rudder, you know. Yeah. Just takes... Rich is a demon now, reversing. <laughs> I, th I think we trained D quite well on the old uh, bow thruster, didn't we? Yeah, not well enough. <laughs> 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 the, the den's still there <laughs> and uh and what changes would you make and would a level of remote control be helpful i mean would you make any changes regarding that or no i don't think we'd ever go remote control we know a uh, solo cruiser don't we she's got remote control on her yeah. boat she swears by it but then again you know it's a solo boat so why not have it if you can so um, yeah. but we, we we wouldn't bother we don't need it do we I would be a bit. I would be a bit nervous about sending your boat off, and you've just got I this. Know, I, I need imagine. to have a rope in my hand all the time. <laughs> I think, but um, it's not particularly us, is it? We're not gadget gimmicky people, are we? Well, you're but, not. Well, that's true. It's like, I'm not. You might be. I'm surrounded by your little bits and pieces, but yeah, I don't know. Nah. And, I, and I think we've spoke about the next question before because Sean's kind of covered it in, in please explain your internet setup and we've also asked before what's your favourite gadget and I think they're kind of um, one and the same aren't they? Favourite gadget? Am I, am I missing something Paul? The Wi-Fi the wi thing. Yeah this is amazing. Oh see what you hear. There we go. This is our Wi-Fi. It's a MiFi device. 
it's run with EE service provider and this <laughs> is a high-tech high underpants hook for hooking on the curtain rail and um, lots of people spend lots of money on Wi-Fi um, capabilities on their boat we just use this it does let you down now and again if you really 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 need faultless Wi-Fi don't have this but 99% of the time this yeah. is fine and it's cheap and it's easy and we upload massive files to YouTube and this does it doesn't do it super fast but it does it you know instead so you know it's uploading a file takes two hours sometimes well sometimes it's taken a whole day hasn't it but sometimes uh, you even have to go to the pub yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pint of it. Wi -Fi, they call it <laughs> yeah this is brilliant this is uh just a MiFi gadget from EE. And it is works that really though? Well. Is that your favourite gadget? 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 Yeah. How about all your camera stuff? Yeah. Oh. And your drone. Well, we need that for the videos, don't we? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's good gadget. I think the, the gadget is the sort of the clip for the pants, really, that hangs it up there. <laughs> yeah. I think so. Is, I yeah. mean, that is, that's like that state of the art. And I think we might be marketing floating our boat ones of these because yeah, that was ingenious, wasn't it? Yeah, there we go. And is and um, is mobile reception pretty good, I suppose, is probably the next one. Is you know, have, some... you, there are some blind spots, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah, there are blind spots, and we spent the whole of last summer with our friends from One Day More Aboard on the east side of the mid of the Midlands, going up the River Seven, uh, the River Saw. Trent, and oh. the River Saw, and down to Lincoln and Boston. It is awful. That side of the country is awful. And Oxford it? as well. Then well brilliant, was it? Not yeah. British, was it? No. But um, here, this is fantastic. The, the up upload and download speed from from this is is brilliant. I mean, it's not fantastic, you know, but it it does what we want it to do. We can stream films, you know, so that's good. It was the deal would have been the deal breaker for the mooring once we'd found this mooring spot, which was you say are like you know hen's teeth. They're so difficult. If the internet or the phone signal had been no good, we wouldn't have done it. Not to be, we can manage for three or four days when we're out and about mm. with no signal. It's quite nice. But to be somewhere all the time, you know, we've had incidences in the past when the family have tried to get hold of us and couldn't. So it's it is important that yeah, and we used to be on different networks as well, just to cover ourselves so that if yours wasn't available, mine was. But um we're not we're on the same now, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. EE, yeah. that's the one. Um, are you allowed to say that? Yeah. <laughs> as done now <laughs> <laughs> i mean do, and do you i mean do you guys have phones on different networks just to sort of cover it off or do you is it just to, fran was saying we used to fran used to have a uh, vodafone and, and we've had three oh, yeah. in the past and now we've gone back to ee because it, they are by far the best in my opinion anyway yeah so, and i think a lot of the boaters out there listen reading the discussion forums on on facebook etc will agree you know yeah not yeah. the cheapest but they do the job I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those things i think with the modern society is kind of how, how it's become an important part of the, the whole life aboard sort of thing yeah. hasn't it yeah yeah and especially, especially for us we up, we're uploading videos as i said but also mm -hmm. we don't have a television so we haven't got an aerial uh for television but now and again we like to watch movies stream f films and uh the odd nature programs or whatever and and you need it you need it these yeah. days i think so i think so and it, and it is it is i mean you go back sort of 10 15 years it wasn't even in existence you people had to go and do cinema and stuff so it's kind of yes yeah, it is one of those huge huge developments that sort of happened fairly recently i suppose and yeah and as much as you know you like to think in a way that when you're on the boat you're away from the outside world and we come on here and we're on the, the little canal world detached from everything else it is still important to be able to make contact mm. isn't it, with the outside world as well. You, you just feel very isolated, I think, if you couldn't. And uh, Philip, I mean, it, kind of kind of in the same sort of vein, Philip Holiday's just questioning, what's your electrical setup? Alternator, solar, inverter, batteries, <laughs> all that sort of thing. And, uh, and have you ever thought about that? <laughs> and have you ever thought about upgrading to lithium? Oh. This is one oh. of our favorite. This is one of, as an insurance company. This is one of our favorite questions. <laughs> we um, we've got 
batteries. We've got a three kilowatt Victron inverter on an MPT thing or other, whatever that means. We, we as you can tell, we're not electrical savvy. Um, it works fine. It's absolutely brilliant. The inverter has just been kicking in. The fan's been on and off this evening. It always does at this time of year. But um, it works fine. Um, we've got five leisure batteries. Um, they're brilliant. And after two years, they're still providing all the power we need. And we're not power hungry, are we, on this boat? I think that's one of the key things, really, is that we've got nothing apart from the computer stuff. Mm. There's hardly anything electrical, mm. is there? Even the coffee is ground by hand. Everything, I was grinding spices up with a pestle and mortar the other day. We just don't have anything electrical on here. So we do manage. We are beginning to think that towards the end of last winter, um, we were struggling a little bit, weren't we, when it was cold. So we might have to have the batteries checked this year um, just to see what they're like. But what do you think regarding lithium? Well, I was talking to um, our boat builders at Creek Boat Show the other day, and he's built a, a hybrid boat, which has got a, a diesel generator. But uh, most of it is on batteries. He wanted to fit traditional battery types, acid or whatever they're called. But the customer insisted on lithium. He didn't want to put lithium in because of the um, hazard of them. They can they can burst into flames, can't they? I don't know. I'm, I'm, not up on it that much but from our point of view i know we've got lithium batteries in our laptops lithium batteries in the phone i don't think we'd go to lithium batteries for the boat because of the environmental impact and also the mining of them and how they're being mined there's no such thing as a clean lithium battery so if we don't have to have lithium batteries then we won't have lithium batteries and i think as far as we're concerned any any use of electricity is a cost to the planet wherever it's come from so to give you something and make you think that it's safe and it's environmentally friendly just means you're going to use more um and our well for instance there's a boat moored on the same moorings further along and they've been running their generator for an hour or so over the last few days because it's not been quite as sunny because they're obviously quite a high demand for electricity because we've got nothing we don't we don't need the electricity and that's how i'd rather be i'd rather not just have more power i'd rather use less but we're not we we're, we're not experts and we're probably ignorant on the on the full yeah. facts of everything but uh, we're happy as we are that we've got as much power as we'll ever need when the sun's shining like this we can run the washing machine without running the engine so that's fine. Yeah. That's all, all good. Yeah. That sounds not very, very sort of all comprehensive, really. Um, um would a would a Simon Hamilton's asked, would life be easier or more convenient for you if you had access to a car or van? Um we've run, we've had a car for the first, what was it, year or so when we had first got on the mm -hmm. system, and it is such a pain. <laughs> It's such a pain to have to keep going back and getting the car and bringing it to where you are, then cruising, then going back to get the car. And if you don't need a car, don't have one. Where we are, the bus system is fantastic. We can go into the nearest town. We can get the train to wherever in the country we want to, and we do. And the bus is great at the moment. The bus fares are two pounds flat anywhere. So mm. uh, it's that suits us, and that we like that lifestyle. We like adventures. We we, we get. We, we actually look forward to a bus ride, It don't sounds we? silly, doesn't it? But it is, it's a, it's a sort of a bit of a day out now. I guess once a week we'll get on the bus to a town nearer, nearby to go and get shopping and stock up on stuff. And um, we're already planning, there's a particular Waterstones bookshop, which I need to go to, that is a need. And it's a bus and two trains away. I think. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. So that will be a, a bit sad, but it'll be a day out for us. Whereas if it was a car journey, it would just be a pain because you'd have to drive in and park. And it does make you think and plan ahead because if you've got a car sat near your mooring, you think, "Oh, I'll just pop to the shops, or I'll just go and get yeah. this, or whatever." Um, so you you do have to be mindful of where you're going to be what have you got in your cupboards do you need to go and get some to something to stock up but having said that we think nothing of doing a five six mile round trip where we are now to go to the shops uh, yeah. with backpacks on 
just to fill up, don't we? Fortunately, you know, because neither of us have to travel to work, that would be the clincher, I guess, mm -hmm. if you had to do that, or if you've got other family commitments. But um, I've got family, or we've got family down near London and in Brighton, and I recently took a train down for a day and stayed over and uh, worked it out. Sometimes we hire a car. We do hire a car if we need one, but we don't enjoy it. Anymore. We hired a car to for Creek Boat Show, and then oh. after Creek Boat Show, we went down to visit our daughter in near Brighton. Oh man, it was awful, wasn't it? The yes. traffic, and it took us on the way home. It took us something like eight hours yeah. from here, Brighton back up to here. Yeah. So uh, no, we don't miss driving. I, I guess you know you might say it's easier if you've got a car, but it's you know the traveling is part of the adventure for us now, isn't it? So. And it's the expense of a car as well, isn't it? You know yeah. anything repairs on a car yeah. these days it's astronomical yeah. so uh, no we don't miss in that at all I, I suppose there's also the tricky question is where do you keep it at night <laughs> well, it's, it's going right. to be a different place isn't it <laughs> yeah it is yeah. I and mean, we could while we're here now at the mooring we ha we did toy with the idea of getting a little camper van that we could travel off with but for the same reasons great shout. Know, that once we've got it great shout yeah <laughs> <laughs> for, the same, for the same reason that we know that once we've got it it changes your life a little bit because suddenly you fancy an ice cream and you can oh I shouldn't have said that as a bad excuse yeah. that's a bad reason fancy but you can <laughs> you can pop into town and excuse. get it and it uh, it just sort of seems to complicate things a little yeah, bit rather than make yeah. it easier, I think. I don't think we'd use it enough to justify it anyway. So. No. But, I mean, I mean, it's it, this sort of covers off, there's a couple of points that have been made around the shopping and laundry side of things. Um, Cecil's asked about laundry. Do you have a washing machine on board? And there's also, have you ever had any sort of issues where you haven't been that close to shops or anything like that, where it's been tricky to get to shops, or is it always generally pretty pretty available? Um, it's an interesting one, actually, because I don't think we've ever been, as you said, because we will walk, I don't think we've ever felt that we can't get to shops. You can always choose to moor up near a town if you want to when you're travelling. The problem is, and it's going to sound like we're, you know, we're trying to be something special, but it's the, it's the quality of the shopping. For instance, we can't find green grocers always. You can only get to supermarkets by the canals. Um, so you haven't got the choice of shopping. I'm not sure that it's any different on a canal boat as it, anywhere else nowadays. I think it's just shopping has changed. Mm. Um, but it's I think it's within your control. Even as continue cruiser, you can you can moor up on the edge of town. And in fact, we always do in the winter if the weather's looking to turn bad. We always moor up within a a, a mile, I guess, of a of a shop even if it's a corner shop that you know you can get groceries and i think i think shopping when you're living on the canal boat as well is is more expensive because there isn't the variety unless you're going to moor in a town every day there isn't the variety and, and more often than not you're relying on a small co-op shop um mm. which is you know a bit more expensive than the shops in the in the cities or the towns would be so yeah, it's a little bit more expensive, and the and you're limited with variety, aren't you as well? But I think that the trick is to stock up, as we've said before, with store cupboard basics when you can, so that you know that you can survive without a shop. Um, and also, you do have to change the way. You can't suddenly think, oh, we want this particular meal tonight, or we want something. It's a case of well, what's in the cupboard. That's what you have to have. Um, so it's just a different way of living, I think. It is for us. Anyway, you know, there's other yeah. people out there that wouldn't agree with that, that you can get shopping deliveries as well. We could easily have um, a supermarket delivery delivered here and they will deliver to bridges for you as well. You know, they will phone you when they're near a particular bridge and you'll go and collect your delivery. But we've never, never felt the need to do that. We've never done it, have we? No. Yeah. I never thought they'd do I that. That's it. a really <laughs> relevant. Sorry, Paul. I never thought I never thought I'd see that, but that's a really amazing development, isn't it? The, yeah, the, I think yeah, a lot of the yeah. supermarkets, well, if you give them a postcode and then they give you an hour slot and they just phone you when they're there. Yeah. Um, um, as long as there's road access or a car park, you can get your shopping delivered. Lots of boaters do do it, but we just haven't felt the need. So, yeah. I, 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 what about laundry? Do you actually have a washing machine on board or do you do that when you go into towns and things like that? Or is 
No, we have our washing machine. Well, we've always have had a washing machine. On our first boat, we had a very interesting, characterful little twin tub that actually had a name Edna. as well, Edna. Um, <laughs> so that was hard work again. That was, it was going back to the old days when you had laundry day, because it would take me ages or a whole cruise. To, I could only use it when we were cruising. And um, But now in the summer, we've got a full-size domestic washing machine on the boat. Um, and you can we we in the winter when the power is low we tend to put it on when we're cruising this time of year when the solar power is so good we can use it any time um yeah it's we not do good. use laundrettes for quilts and stuff like that occasionally yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but uh yeah when we need to and, and so, and sort of move, moving a little bit off the practicality side of things you know you've, you've already said that you've got the youtube channel you've also got a couple of other sort of income sources being the, the weaving um i'm gonna get the name wrong but constanza crafts is it have i got that wrong or creations <laughs> creations thank you <laughs> constanza creations we'll edit that bit in later um, so, it <laughs> so it doesn't look so bad uh, so and, and so you've got sort of various sources of income to sort of help you help you get through the sort of day-to-day -day, i suppose yeah i mean that was it was never the plan to make money out of all those things initially when we first bought our first boat the plan was to fund our travels through the rental of a holiday cottage mm. but gradually I became a game where the people wanted to buy the scarves and the things that I was weaving you're selling artwork as well now aren't you um and yeah, it's become an important part of our life now. It is, that is our work, really, and the video making is our work. Yeah, as um, I said earlier on, we're employed doing things we actually like, and we're really fortunate in that sense, yeah. aren't we? So. And it doesn't quite make uh, as, as much as we need to live on. We are sort of, we've got a little pot of savings that we're chipping away at, but really and truly, it more or less manages. We more or less manage on it, don't we? Yeah, we do. Um, so it is, you know, everything I sell is so important on everything we sell with your artwork and the stuff in our merchandise shop. It's enabling us to carry on doing this and to make the videos. Otherwise, we couldn't do it, could we? So, so yeah. get your floating, floating our boat mug now, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Go to floatingourboat.com. Um, and Shelley's asked a question, if you sell online only, not physically from the boat, do you need a trader's license? Yes, you do. Yeah. Apparently so. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's because I don't know, I don't quite know the legitimacy of it, but you do need a trader's license. And we do keep thinking of setting up shop up on canal side now, but we've never got just got quite round to it, have we? We've but never sold from the canal side, have we? No. Um, no. Because I don't think we've ever got ahead of ourselves enough to have enough stuff to sell and again it's going to be putting pressure on us to do that isn't it yeah it's, it just sounds like work but, um, know, to be honest yeah and there's a lot of in fact the kind of the traders license is quite interesting because people think it's going to be a massive expense the traders license is not as well as your boat license it's instead of and it's really not very much more money than your ordinary license um so it is worth doing um, and you do get some benefits from it. Um, I'm going to put myself out here because I don't know that Haven. No, what is it you get from traders? Oh, you know, you get benefits because you can stay in somewhere a day longer you if can. you want to. You yeah, get an extra a day at a mooring spot. So if it's only two days and you're trading, you can stay for three days. Um, so there are some benefits and there's some benefits with your fuel tax as well, with your diesel, if you're a trader as well. So there are some things you know some benefits for it but yeah that's, well, that's i hope that's answered i hope that's answered the question um course, going through the questions online which ones to pick next is the next one um golly uh okay oh this one's kind of late weaving and painting work this is tom shaw's asked this weaving and painting work fairly well on a boat was that something you did before you got on the boat besides Besides that and gardening, what else are you thinking of doing? <laughs> well, that's a very long, open question, that one. <laughs> Nothing. Um, you never was a weaver, really, before we came on board the boat. You just got an interest in it, hadn't you, when we first muted the idea of coming on board? So every <clears throat> the boats that we've had, we've had to have um, space for Fran and her weaving. 
fortunately, Franz Loom folds up very much like a, a clothes horse does, you know, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's only that wide when folded and, and uh, waist high. But what you get out of it is amazing, isn't it? Unfortunately, the bags and bags of wool don't fold up small. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they probably take up quite a lot of space, I would have thought. They, yeah, they do, they do. But that's, you know, as much as the books are ballast, the wool is insulation, Paul, so it's fine. And also, you're, you're spinning most more and more of your own stuff now, aren't you? I am now. In fact, we've, I've just finished spinning wool that we picked off of the fences on a walk, and I'm spinning that. I don't know quite know what it's going to be. But you've always dabbled with art. Richard's got some f fabulous art going back years and years and years, but you you thought life was too busy for you to do yeah, that, wasn't was, it? Yeah, um, since, since being on the boat, <clears throat> especially in the last two or three years, I've picked up more. I don't do enough as... Uh, it's like I've had a, a spell now of two months probably where I haven't really created anything. Bec that's because the garden's taken over a bit more. But uh, the last couple of days I've spent all day, both days, just putting paint on paper, haven't I? Yeah, you've had a really good day today. Mm. And what are we thinking of? Anything more we're thinking of doing? Well, we've said that we've toyed with the idea of writing a little bit yeah yeah maybe um i would actually quite like to start dyeing my own wool now i've got a little bit of space to do it outside so i might move into that i think all our creative boxes are ticked at the moment aren't they so <laughs> you would like to write though wouldn't uh, yeah, you? Would, you would like would, to write i though. think i've got a book in me but uh we'll see <laughs> well i see that being a bestseller <laughs> um Vera from Maryland has asked, if you have no boating experience, want to do a vacation narrowboating in the UK, how difficult is it to learn to drive or handle one? It's, it's not, not difficult it's not at difficult. all. You can no. pick it up immediately. And you, most reputable um, holiday boat companies will give you a good uh, hour or so at the helm before you, they leave you alone yeah and it's it's not it really isn't difficult to steer a boat a lot of people do get frightened of it because at the end of the day they're expensive things they really are and if you're bumping and crashing in and out of locks you can do some damage but the maxim is slow everything is slow on the canals it's yeah. canal speed and uh we're on a couple of holiday boat routes here, aren't we? There's either side, and I know certainly this way they come out and they take the they take you through a lock with the boat first and instruct you how to do it, and then off you go. And we haven't seen any terrible driving, have we, from no. people? We just it really isn't. And if you think about it, I'd never driven a boat. I'd never been on a narrow boat um, when we got ours. And Rich taught me from what you'd learned when you were a teenager. Well, when we were so, kids, mum and dad had a boat when I was 10. So um, I'd remembered all the, all these years uh, how to drive a boat. And as soon as we got on Constanza, I just managed to steer it without any problems. So yeah. And then when it was Fran's turn to drive, she was quite happy as long as I was with her, weren't you? And yeah. then one day I just jumped off at a bridge heading towards a lock. And I said, well, that's your turn now, Fran. You've got to take it through. Yeah. That was the best thing I did, really, wasn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, uh, yeah, because yeah, I was you're... getting to the stage where I was getting a little bit nervous. It was becoming an issue that I didn't mm. want to do this driving into a lock. Um, and I think we'd only been on the boat about a week, hadn't we? And yeah, I had to do it, and that's fine. But if you fancy yeah. coming to England and hiring an Arab boat, just do it. Yeah. Absolutely, just do it. Yeah. And I'd sort of link to that. Is there? Have you guys done any other courses, engine maintenance or anything like that, that or any courses that you would recommend people try before going out? We've never done anything. We've never done a helmsman course. We've never had engine maintenance courses. Uh, we've just picked up from experience, haven't we? I think that the beauty of the helmsman's course is if you are nervous about it, then you probably feel more confident once you've done that. Mm. Um, yeah, I, you know, what, what we, we're going to also, we're going to learn our way. So I was going to learn the engine maintenance and felt that I needed to do it on Constanza. I would have liked to have done a course on that. But this boat is different. It's just everything is easier to get to, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe we should have done it. It would be a good thing to, to know more about the engine. I tend to leave that all to you. Yeah, I think a helmsman course is, is a good thing as well. Everybody that we know who's done a helmsman course has said it's fantastic yeah uh, they really apart from enjoying it they got a lot of in, in, information out of it and uh, put them in good stead before they even got on the boat you know so yeah 
Yeah, recommended. For confidence. Yeah. Excellent. And is that, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Peter Clark has asked, is there anything you would do differently if you were starting scratching, starting from voting from scratch? Sorry. I don't think there is. Um, I think just, I don't know. I think maybe spent another 10 or 20 grand on our first boat and got that right. Um, but having said that, we loved how Constanza was rough and ready. And we've always said it's not about the boat. This is our lifestyle. It's not just about the boat. The boat is a vehicle. It's all out there that's in, more interesting to us than anything else. Yeah. And I think we we made that right decision to start off a, a two year trial in our hearts was the right thing to do and then reassess. We didn't just come into it and say, well, this is it. This is the rest of our lives going to be on a boat. Um, we were ready to say, no, this isn't for us if it didn't work. But fortunately, it did. And I don't think I would have done anything differently now. Looking no, back. I mean, don't get us wrong. There aren't, you know, there are times when we think, oh, are we doing the right thing? Is this us for the rest of our lives? We don't know. We just don't know is the honest answer to that. And um, not to say we don't care is, is wrong, but we can't worry about the future. We don't know what the future holds. We've had so many friends and family, unfortunately, sadly, die on us in the last few years, <clears throat> people that are our age and younger. And so uh, our maxim is live every day, just live it. Yeah. Good way to live life. I mean, do, well, I mean, that's like, I mean, that sort of, comes, Debbie and Mike asked, do you ever see yourselves living back on land in the future? And I think you just answered that. It, it, you never know, do you? It's you never know, no. Yeah. We, we do, we you know, we, We've got this lovely image of us in a little cottage in, in, in Cumbria somewhere in the Lake District with a nice garden and roses all around. Um, that would be ideal. But um, we've got that. This, this boat is a floating flat. It's, yeah. as big as, it's as big as people's flats, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and as comfortable as. Yeah. And uh, from that point of view, I mean, this boat will last another 30, 40 years in this water. No problem, especially if it's looked after. And as long as we can get on and off the boats, I don't see any reason at the moment for us to change. We do get itchy feet. I think after a couple of years, we begin to think, what's the next, not project, if you like, but where are we going from here? At the moment, it's been the garden. And now we've got that. Um, we'll just wait and see. As you say, two years time, we might move to a different part of the country. Just We just don't know. We just don't know. But we're at the moment, we're where we need to be. That's all we know. We're coming down to the last few questions. You'll be pleased to hear. There's a, there's a, there's probably about four or five more questions, so we'll whiz through those. Um, <laughs> that's good. Um, somebody said, "Do you ever wish you could ever not be ever be not famous, so you could walk around boat shows looking at your leisure?" <laughs> <laughs> we're not that famous, really, are we? It's only no, the boat show, isn't it? We're well known in a certain minuscule sphere of life. I um, I speak from experience on this one. You, the, the, the people do sort of tend to gravitate towards you. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, who wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> They're only human. <laughs> we we love the attention. Uh, it's, a quick boat show was amazing, if not tiring, but it was amazing. Uh, the Saturday, the first, well, we got there late Friday, but Saturday all day, we just did not stop all day through talking with people that watch us we've never met before but they feel they know us because they watched every single video and it's brilliant and it's brilliant and now we've got people shouting across the towpath hi rich hi fran <laughs> love your garden nice to see you watched you from day one blah blah and it's great it is lovely but it, it's not so much that it affects or interferes with our life it, it really doesn't i mean we can go we can go into town and we can do what we want to do and we're not you know we're not recognized occasionally we are and most people even then we just come up and say how oh, we've seen you and watch the videos and thank you it's not a problem is it and we know what crick is going to be like we gear ourselves up for that um and it's lovely you know yeah, yeah. just find a corner of the hotel to cry in every night <laughs> 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 yeah because it, it, it must be weird because you go from the peace and tranquility of your normal day-to-day -day life and then suddenly crick must be kind of turbocharged and everything is a, everything happens in a very short space of time yeah. i can't pretend that we weren't really glad to get back here after crick no, well, we just sort of sit down and think oh just that's it now just 
Yeah. <laughs> I think we did say never again, but we've forgotten we... it already. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I'll uh, I'll get that in the diary then. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question from Rach, who describes herself, and this is how she's written it, uh, as a grumpy, unorganised mad lady, just about to sell my house and take on boat life. The realism of this, please. You can be as grump yeah. grumpy and as disorganised, unorganised as you like. Um, there's room for everyone. And if you don't like much room in your boat because it's full of stuff, fine. The thing is that you make it is perfect because you can make your life what you want it to be. And we've always said this about the boating. Well, I won't say boating community because I'm not sure that we go along with all that boating community stuff. But there's room for everybody, all kinds of people on the boats. And you never know who you're going to be moored next to. And you never know who you're going to pass up on the canal. And if she wants to be out in the middle of nowhere with no neighbours because she's feeling grumpy, she can do that. And if she wants to be in town so she can moan at other people, she can do that. You know, you can do what you want to do. It's perfect, really, isn't it? So, it is. yeah, go ahead with it. <laughs> uh, the one good thing about this this life is if you're not if you don't like your neighbours, you can just move. Yeah. And uh, that yeah. is brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> and there's plenty um, of opportunities to be grumpy as well on the canals. Uh, isn't there? Believe me, there is. <laughs> <laughs> well, when 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 um when someone crashes your boat for you. We're yeah, going yeah. <laughs> no. um, Craig Foster's asked, sorry if this has been asked already, on your Laura Maisie tour vlog, you talk about having a plan for composting toilet solids waste. What was your plan? Oh, on the Laura Maisie one. On this one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was for actually composting our waste yeah. and getting it reduced down to a physical state that it's inert. Which is what we are doing. Mm -hmm. So we managed to store our compost for long enough that it can actually turn into safe composted waste. And we are doing that. Yeah. That's okay. And Simon Simon Hamilton has asked, do you think YouTube reached do you think YouTube has reached maximum saturation for canal cruising content? <laughs> <laughs> it's not for us to say because there's you know, anybody's welcome to do what they like, but the when we started vlogging, I think there was a dozen of us, and I've said this so many times to people, but I think there were a dozen of us vlogging at that time. I think when I last looked or counted, I think we were above 250 people vlogging. One thing it has done has made the canals really popular out there. And, and look at Crick Boat Show, for, you know. Yeah. Vloggers like us, I think, have made Creek Boat Show so popular and so busy. Yeah. And I and I was talking to another vlogger who, uh, who feels they don't get enough recognition for it from Creek Boat Show organisers, but I don't look for recognition. It's, it does seem like there's, you know, there's so, so many boat YouTubers out there now. But if you look at some of the new ones, they still get really popular really quickly. So there obviously is always room for mm. somebody to that's doing it a little bit different um but you have to work i think we were lucky i don't think now you have to work very hard at it you've got to yeah. find a new angle you can't just come in and put a camera on the front of your boat and film a cruise and expect it to be popular because that's all been done you've got to find a new angle um and it's still happening isn't it there's still every day we're finding new youtubers out there so and we met so many at Crick, didn't we? That that, that yeah. said, oh, we we've done this life because of you two, um, and we're we're vlogging it as well. Well, you yeah. know, that's great. That's really great. I, I do think I do think it's awesome in the fact that what we're seeing is we're seeing a genuine rising up of popularity of. I don't want to say alternative lifestyles, but it is alternative <laughs> lifestyles in a way, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah. I think I think what we're seeing is a genuine interest in people wanting to do research look into it and there's interest in the subject which is which is always good fertile ground for what yeah. you do really i don't know if it, i don't know how long it's been going on for but i think especially since the, the lockdown the pandemic and all that i think that there's a lot more people thinking hang on a minute you know life's too short let's just do this and uh, good luck to them yeah Okay, Marcus Watkin has asked, do you think secondhand boat prices are overinflated at the moment? Haven't really looked. Don't we don't, we're out of touch now with the prices of boats, but we hear a lot of people say they've just gone through the roof. Talking to somebody at Crick, uh, and they seem to think that it, it's stable, and if not 
dip in a little bit now. And I think we may have reached saturation point where boat sales are concerned, secondhand anyway. Um, but it, it just went, it's just gone ridiculous. And um, maybe we're to blame people like us vlogging it, given this lifestyle feeling, you know. I think the price of new boats went up crazily with the cost of steel going up, mm. didn't it? And so therefore, all those secondhand boats didn't have to go up in accordance they did because the demand was there people mm. couldn't afford to buy the new boat so therefore we're looking at second hand and the demand has put the price up i don't know as oh. you say we're really a little bit out yeah. of touch with it yeah. aren't we now so well I was we have been told that you know this boat is two years old and if we wanted to sell it we'd probably get more than we paid for it so uh from that point of view it's crazy yeah yeah should you ever should you ever want to move back on land or anything like that so <laughs> yeah <but> then... <laughs> Uh, Ian Curry has asked, are you worried that the government will cut funding to the CRT and that the CRT won't be able to keep up with repairs to locks, facility points and other infrastructure? Yeah, it's, it's a massive so worry. It really is a massive worry. I mean, um, <clears throat> whichever government's in power comes, I think it's 2027, isn't it? When when the new sure. funding comes into place or not into place. Where they are at that point, I don't know. Everybody likes to moan about Canal and River Trust, and, and I'm as equally uh, guilty of that, especially when they're cutting down orchids on the towpath, etc. But they do a pretty good job, I think, all in all, and they definitely need that funding because th there's no way that they can afford. Their I think they're still firefighting, chasing their tails a little mm -hmm. bit to keep on top of all the um, all the repairs, etc. And it seems to be that there's more and more demands put on them. Um, the, the climate has caused lots and lots of water shortages, which are evident up here. We've got empty reservoirs again up here now. There's a problem at the moment with fish dying in this canal. Um, and it's partly due to the hot weather, but also because of runoff with recent heavy rain or the mm. runoff from the fields. farms and the fields has left a slurry on the canal and the fish are dying. So um, the CRT are having to come in and oxygenate the canals to save the fish. So it's another expense. There's always stuff that they're expected to be doing. And when you think about it, our boat license, which is um, just over a thousand pound a year, I think, is nothing to cover what we get from the CRT. Um, they obviously do need more funding and it is a worry. Yeah, yeah it is a worry. Boat licenses do not cover the 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 funding they need um but they do a pretty good job all in all the guys on the ground you know they're solid people they yeah. they really you know want the best for this this canal system and governments are always looking to save money um so who knows what the future holds for the canal and river trust yeah. let's uh, fingers crossed let's hope it survives okay that, that's brilliant thank you it is and it is true yeah the the, I think the the license funding is a is while it's a sizable part of their budget, it's the government funding is the largest size of their budget. So yeah, it's it's and we all want to, we all want to see our canals continue on into the future for as long as we can. Um, no, thank you for that. I mean, one last comment and then my favourite question, which I'm going to ask at the end. Um, uh, Vera's come back to you, come back to said, please thank Fran and Rich. For for me for the encouragement i absolutely love their sense of humor and down-to-earth style and always look for their youtube videos oh, thanks thank Vera. You. Cheers. Thank you. and finally uh my last the last question and, and i know we've we've probably spoken about this before do you find the need to escape to get some me time very we, rarely very rarely we're we're quite old we we don't get on each other's nerves. We very, very, very rarely argue. And I know that I know a lot of people say, you know, we don't argue, but mm. we don't. And um, if we do get on each other's nerves, we don't row, we don't argue about it. We just, you know, well, for instance, now I could go off in the garden and sulk. <laughs> you learn you can share with each other all the time you learn to read the signs yeah and we've also got a certain little routines for instance in the morning rich will often say to me i'm gonna wash up you do the dogs i've got a podcast to listen to so i will take that as a as a pointer i will take the dogs off for three quarters of an hour he puts the podcast on and washes up and that's our little bit of space in a way isn't it um 
But that's are, all. Are, that's all we do. We did start this life because we wanted to spend time together, all all the time together. We didn't want to both go off to work separately and come and meet each other in the evenings. We've done that for so far, so many years in our lives, you know, previously. A really good example is that when Rich is sitting, editing at the Jeanette, he will normally sit in the position I'm in now, we are in now. My weaving loom is behind. So if he says, what are you doing? Are you weaving? If I'm weaving, he'll turn around and sit the other side so he can look at me. So you can see me. <laughs> so we can talk to each other. Um, it's just it's never a problem is it really and we do have a bedroom that closes you know if you want to go off and read your book for half an hour but I don't think that often happens is it I have 15 minutes 30 minutes of meditation some days not every day um and I don't know you watch watch some rubbish, rubbish. stuff on the on YouTube every we, now and again still, don't you we but... still talk to each other we still have conversations about our days about other topics or topics that are new to us we find something interesting to say to each other every day and um long may it be yeah well Fran and Rich I've got to say thank you very much from all of us at Haven Knox Johnston and thank you from all of our listeners you've given us a, a whole load of your time a great deal of information you've answered so many questions which has been awesome thank you very much so um, we really enjoyed it yeah. <clears throat> and thanks to everybody for stopping by uh, it's uh, no, th absolutely i mean it's 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 been it's been it's been a good attendance and we're, we're you know there's some really really interesting questions to uh to to sort of keep the conversation going it's gone on a lot, lot longer than i thought we really did um but obviously if 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 this, the content of this webinar and obviously any we do do other webinars such all around all sorts of subjects so do feel free to check out both obviously you've got fran and rich is floating our boat channel but do check out the haven dog johnson one as well you've got some haven helpful hints in there about all sorts of things as well so um don't forget to check all that out so thank you very much indeed and um we'll let fran and rich go back to their evening and peace and quiet and thank you very much Thank you. Cheers. Thanks Thank a you, lot. Everybody. Take care. Bye.